Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Daniel Epstein. I'm an assistant professor here in informatics. Um, and I'm uh, in charge of kind of scheduling the, the seminar series and, and I'm in charge of the 209S class that's associated with it. So if you have any questions about that class, feel free to uh, message me or, or talk to me about that. Um, we have a really great set of speakers this quarter. Um, due to COVID, we've uh, had some speakers who we were really hoping to that would be able to come in person, but uh, obviously under the circumstances, it's been more difficult to do that. So um, uh, AM's talk today, as well as our next two talks are remote. Um, and then some other talks later in the quarter are, are already scheduled to be to be virtual as well, and, and we'll have to see how things go uh, with regards to the other talks. Um, but definitely take a look at the schedule that's online already. We have a lot of really great speakers this quarter. And um, yeah, Aaron, you want to introduce AM? Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce AM Dark uh, to the speaker series, um, to, to, to open up our speaker series for the winter quarter. Um, I think it's really exciting that you're here, AM. Uh, for some context, I, I met AM um, about two years ago at Indiecade when um, I was uh, demoing their game, Yay or Nay, uh, I think for a live streamed audience. And I was just struck by how profoundly brilliant that game was and how profoundly brilliant after going and doing the deep dive of all the other work that AM has done, um, all the work that uh, basically he's put out over the past few years is just like totally, totally amazing. Um, for those of you who are not so um, familiar with the discourse of what's happening in games and play today, uh, games and play have an overwhelmingly white male dominated history. And that history is culminated into a really um, sort of uh, uh, reductionist aesthetic artifact around games and stuff where games themselves cater to a very specific audience. And AM's work is this sort of like sweet spot of artistic work that is both accessible and brilliant insofar as it subverts this set of tropes and really allows us to see games um, and see different, uh, to challenge ourselves to see ourselves in games, to have them reflect our own identities and our own stereotypes that we bring to the table. And so that way, I think that they really go out of their way to uplift um, and challenge people to um, uh, break out of the sort of uh, typical way of seeing games uh, within the sort of like white male uh, cis head <laughs> hegemony. So I'm really pleased to introduce AM. I just think your work is so brilliant and I can't wait for this talk. So please uh, educate us. Thank you so much. Um... Oh, what is happening? So many pop-ups. Okay, you can hear me. Yes, everyone can hear me. Great. Um, yeah, thank you for such a wonderful, warm introduction, Aaron. I really uh, appreciate that. And I've appreciated the ways in which you've engaged with my work. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. Uh, Black aesthetics, interventions in digital media. I decided I wanted to um, title this talk after uh, a class that I'm teaching now. And like many scholars, I'm teaching a class because I don't know all about this stuff, actually. I'm working in this space, but I haven't really fully theorized it. There's all sorts of other scholarship and in, 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 uh, creative activity um, that's rooted in critical histories that I have yet to engage with. So I thought, what's the best way to get me to read a bunch of books is to teach a class on that. Um, so one of the things that's exciting for me about giving a talk like this and also uh, anxiety-inducing is that this is still messy for me. This is still unresolved. And um, when I make work, it's usually because I started with a question that I didn't have a good answer to, that I didn't have, um, I'm trying to tease out the nuance and I'm trying to tease out the different perspectives and, and come to understand what is my own position in this area. So I don't have the answers and that's what makes this work exciting. And I hope that this will be exciting for you as well. So again, I'm Ann Dark, that's my cat Pepper. She's locked in the room because if she weren't, she would be jumping on my shoulders and in my hair and doing all kinds of stuff and stealing the spotlight. Um, I am focused right now on black virtuality. 
And I'm still even figuring out what that means. But for now, I think about Black virtuality as the way that uh, Black bodies, Black cultures, and Black identities are consumed, constructed, expanded, erased, remixed, unmade, remade, all the verbs, all the verbs you can think of, right? But in virtual space. This is new, super new theory. When I say super new theory, I mean, I typed this on a typewriter like two days ago, and then it sort of gelled in my head last night. And then I quickly tried to put in some, some slides because I've never talked about this. So if it seems messy or fuzzy, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That's okay. We're getting there. So as I was thinking about Black virtuality, I was thinking about these categories, right? These three, Black bodies, Black identities slash experiences, which I think of as also Black stories. That's all one category for me and thinking about Black culture. In the work that I'm doing now and the work that I'm going to discuss today, I'm mostly focused on Black bodies and Black stories or experiences because I think in virtual space, Black culture is already saturated. And one of the issues that I'm contending with in my practice and, and, and trying to understand is actually the way in which Black culture exists often uh, detached from these other two categories, detached from black bodies and uh, uh, black experience. So an example of this to me is, this is the swipe at dance from uh, the massively successful game Fortnite, right? But for those in black culture, for those who maybe don't even play games, we know this as the Millie Rock, right? And this was a game created by a black artist to Millie in a popular song, a popular dance. When I see um, Fortnite use this dance, uncredited, erasing the contribution of the Black artists, not compensating that Black artist, and eventually to really actually sued Fortnite uh, or sued Epic Games, I see this as Black culture, right, extracted from a Black body. Even in terms of representation, we see this on a white character. We see this on any character, right, in the game, but it's been taken, it's been removed from the Black body, and it's been removed from a Black experience and been uh, neutralized in a way. Soul, gosh, I love soul, have problems with soul. This is the nature, really, this is the nature of even working in games, right? Always being critical of the, the media that you consume and that you appreciate. So Soul was released in 2020, celebrated for being the first um, film within uh, Pixar that had a Black lead right, is telling a Black story. For those of you who, who saw Soul, for those of you who didn't, it follows a Black musician who's, who's trying to make it. He's been a music teacher for most of his life, but he's always tried to, you know, actually um, um, uh, find success in, in his career as a musician primarily. And he gets his big break. In the, and this is, what, this is what the film is about. But we only see this character with his Black story and his Black body, right, Black virtual body. You see this as you know, a black man with phenotypically black features. Um, he doesn't end up in this body for very long. I really like this image because what happens is pretty early on into the film, uh, he's taken out of this body and he's represented as, as this little blue character, right? And you can see that some of the main features of blackness, some of the things I think of as, as being phenotypically black are our full lips, broader noses, our deep skin, right? That melanin, these are all removed, right? You will see thin lips, no nose. And I think this may be a stretch, but I wanna say it anyway. When I think about um, white Eurocentric standards of beauty, I feel like making a nose disappear is pretty high up there. And we see that on both of these characters, right? When the, so when this character exists in the real world, there are two worlds, right? There's the spirit world, and so you see uh, this character in blue, and then there's the human world that he's trying to get back to, so it doesn't miss his big break. When this character exists in the human world, this Black experience, right, this Black identity exists in the form of this cat, a non-Black body. So again, we're seeing this disjuncture between the Black body and the Black identity. We're seeing this disconnect between, even in a Black story, we don't get to have all of it, right? We don't get to see Blackness, to me, as a whole, often. And this is when we have representation at all, which I'm gonna uh, talk about a little bit later. Um, something to note in this, about this film, because it's gonna come back up in the talk, is that um, a character voiced by white woman, Tina Fey, is, 
the spirit is the soul that's inhabiting uh, the black uh, man's body for most of the film. So again, there's this kind of possession, right? You have a black body, we have representation, but then whose identity is within that body? A non-black person, a white woman in this case. And so this gets into the murky area of representation, right? Like for years now, it's like representation matters, hashtag, it's great, it's wonderful. Does it though? Does it? Does it? Um, I've got some kind of like, I feel like I've got represent, representation fatigue. So I'm definitely being a little bit reactive today because I recently had some press around a new work and it's reminding me of um, sort of uh, responses to an early work of mine. So this image is actually from uh, the first game that I ever released, which was a game called Objective. So just a quick overview because definitely going to run out of time. But um, just a quick overview. Objective is a game similar to other party games where there's um, a, a judging mechanic, right? So you have one judge, you have other players competing um, to, for the benefit of that judge to decide who wins a particular round. In Objective, all of the cards are these hand-drawn illustrations meant to represent Black women. And the point of the game is to find the most attractive card. So you get um, a, few, a few cards in your hand and you're looking through them. And depending on who the judge is, say it's me, say it's Aaron, say it's Daniel, right? You're going to select a card to say, okay, this is who I think uh, you're gonna find most attractive. And you're competing with, with other players in the round. Um, this game was made entirely of depictions of Black women. There are more black women in this game than I think in any game ever. I think still this is true. And I made this in like 2011. Um, and I made this in response actually to an article uh, on Psychology Today's website that was published at the time that was titled, Why are black women less physically attractive than other races? Pause for that. Uh, that's a whole area to get into and you can read about it on my portfolio. I talk, I link to the, to the article and I talk more about this work. But one of the things that happened with this work is that it was, um, it was nominated for a few awards. It won some awards. It took me, you know, it flew me uh, across the ocean. It was really exciting that this work was um, so well received, but I felt like it was a little bit too well received. And it started to be talked about in terms of empathy work. And then I started to go, oh, oh no, what's happened here? Something's gone wrong. Because empathy and its um, accomplice, its buddy, inclusion, to me, these are colonizing frameworks. These are frameworks that I'm trying to break out of. And it's really difficult actually to be a marginal, to be in a marginalized body, to be a marginalized artist, making work about what is a normal everyday experience for me and not have it be looked at as trying to make myself legible to others. And not just looked at, I'll be honest, sometimes it's hard to get out of that framework myself to not constantly be reacting and positioning myself and trying to make myself visible in these spaces that I inhabit. So the, when I say that these are colonizing frameworks, it's because both of these, both empathy and inclusion tend to position in this case, blackness as the other. Uh, when people look at um, my work and they say this is about inclusion, I think, well, that implies that Blackness only exists, you know, through the perspective of a dominant group. And really, I want to make work that centers Blackness for myself and for Black communities, right? When I think about the fact that I'm putting Black hair into digital spaces, when that's framed as inclusivity, I think, it's or, or normalization or some of these other words, I think, well, but it's not normalization because this hair is normal, it's my hair. And black hair has been every single game that I've made since the beginning, right? I'm not just sort of comparing my work to others. I'm, I'm just making work that reflects the body that I'm in and the experiences that I have. So here's the big question. Here's the mess. How do we break free of this bullshit, right? Like how do we do this as marginalized people? In this case, as a black person, as a black femme, queer, person, how do I get out of that loop where everything that I make is, is, you know, compared to something else, or suddenly it's like, I can make a game about anything about my, you know, humor or jokes. And it's like, that's diversity. That's social justice. That's, I mean, I'm grateful for the social impact awards I've been up for, but gosh, that gets old. 
So I'm going to show you two works today. One you may already be familiar with. One is, is this one, uh, Yay or Nay, that Aaron uh, talked about and, and was um, uh, his introduction to my work. And so I'm going to tell you, I'm basically going to go over two strategies. And this was the first one. So this is the game, Yay or Nay. It's online. It's free. You can play it. It's at uh, yayornay.cool. Oh, wait a minute. I jumped the gun. Let me go back. I knew I had this in a better order. Okay. So a little bit of the artist statement to start with. Yerne is a take on Guess Who, where all of the characters are Black men and half, half of them are Kanye West. It examines the language we use to describe and differentiate Black men, asking, what does it mean to say brown skin when all of the subjects are Black? The really interesting thing to me um, in this game is that it really wrestles with the idea of the problematic faith. Like Kanye to me is a perfect figure for this kind of work because you know now uh, as faculty at UC Santa Cruz, I'm teaching students and I'll bring up Kanye. And most of my students at this point, um, they know Kanye as you know the bombastic black man who interrupted Taylor Swift. Did, you know, interrupted her at a moment where she was receiving an award on television. What a jerk. And then, you know, all the other stuff that, I, that I'm trying to block out of my mind for the past few years. We're not, we're not gonna talk about that today. We, good vibes only. I know Kanye when I was just starting out in community college, when I was, I think I was 18 when this happened. It was during Hurricane Katrina, during the Red Cross uh, fundraising telethon. And, you know, this is a really traumatic day. You know, it, every, they're raising money. This is everything that's on the news. And Mike Myers, the live on television, turns to Kanye West and they're supposed to stick to a script and try to get donations. And Kanye says a number of things. He talks about um, the war in Afghanistan. He talks about the way that American society is set up not to help the poorest people, the most marginalized people, the black people. And then he kind of very inarticulate and impassioned, which is part of the strength of, of, this, of this scene. If you haven't watched it, you absolutely should. And then after a little pause, when it's clear he hasn't, he can't quite get all of his thoughts together, he just decides to be as direct as possible. And with a completely deadpan, serious face, looks into the camera, camera and says, George Bush does not care about Black people. And it is the funniest thing I've ever seen. To this day, still so funny, still so true, but also so authentic. And so from that moment on, I loved Kanye because I had never seen a figure of a black male celebrity say something so transgressive, especially so early in their career with such little power. And it was so authentic. It was so real. His voice actually trembles when he says it. And so that's my Kanye. And so now when I think about the trajectory of his material and capitalistic success, along with what to me is, is, is transparent emotional suffering, I think of him as, as a critical figure as I, as I think about how do I address Black culture? How do I have real meaningful conversations about, about Black culture? How, do I, how can I be critical of our icons when so often in Black communities, we're aware that there's an antagonistic gaze looking at us. There's a sense often that, well, let's not air that dirty laundry in public because we know they're always looking for a way to denigrate and dehumanize us. We can't give them any more fodder. And this is a conundrum because with the rise of social media, this is one way in which black communities have been connected. This is the way that we're sharing our knowledge, right? When we feel like islands, social media can allow us to become archipelagos. And so how do you do that when you're having public discourse, but constantly aware of this other gaze? So this was my attempt to actually break out of that. Um, I make independent artsy weirdo games. And so often the spaces I'm operating are places like Indiecade and other smaller independent game festivals, right? I'm not AAA. And I found, if I'm honest, that when I'm making work, I find myself still kind of playing to the presumed, not the same gamer audience, when we talk about the presumed cisgender, straight, white male, but a version of that actually a presumed white liberal indie audience that frankly is, is responsible for categorizing my work as empathy work or inclusion work or whatever the hell. 
So I thought, gosh, what if I, if I, if, if objective fell into that category and was celebrated for that, how can I do something that feels like, like it's just for me, it's just for us. How can I talk to other black people about these issues without thinking about and considering this other gaze? And so I made yay or nay. Uh, so like I said, it's works like Guess Who. Uh, you have a mystery person here in the center. In this case, it's James Earl Jones. You have, um, this is representative of your opponent's board. So you know kind of um, uh, where you're at in the game without revealing um, their mystery person. So it works like Guess Who. You know, you might ask, uh, is your person wearing glasses? And I'll say, no, because I'm a big liar. So, you know, you're gonna click around and close all of these cards that have glasses, right? Yes or no questions. Um, and of course, you know, in this game, I'm getting away from binarized identity. So there's that component. And in, in the traditional guess who there, I believe it's five different feature sets. And I think the original one, they were all white, um, but it would be like, okay, five people have glasses, five people have blue eyes, five people have brown, brown eyes. And so you're looking for these really concrete distinctions. Um, in the games that I played, the more modern versions, there are uh, black and brown people, but again, the skin tone becomes another binary. It's like, well, are they brown? Are they black? Are they this? So I wanted to play with this idea of like, well, what if there's, um, what if they're all the same gender and what if they're all the same race? How does that change the game? And then how does that allow us to dig into the nuanced ways that we describe blackness? And knowing that I'm just designing a game for black folks and rooted in black culture, but also that other people will play, what advantages does it give me that, for example, you know, I know what a red bone is, right? And I know different names of black haircuts and maybe a non-black person or a person who's not invested and rooted in and living in black community will have that same language. And then what does that reveal? So on the surface, I think that's a pretty strong game, pretty cool, pretty fun, people get it right away. Like many of my games, like an objective actually, um, there's always a kind of obscure mechanic, mechanic, and in this case, it's this one. If you right-click these cards, you get a cultural perspective on each of these Black characters. So, and by the way, there's several different Kanye. So the game is talking about the, the you know, so... <laughs> You know, there's a statement, right? Blackness is not a monolith. Well, here, Blackness exists in many forms. And even a single person like Kanye exists in multiple forms. So here we go. He finally at left our ass for a white girl. When did Ye begin to equate having a white woman on his arm as the ultimate prize? The moment when even if you in a Benz, you still in again a coupe, seemed to personally hit home for Kanye. He made that transition to affluence and got hit with that rich nigga racism. Again trying to hold a nuanced perspective on this figure as they move through white supremacy, as they move through, to quote Bell Hooks, right, white supremacist capitalist patriarchy and aspire to it, but can never seem to fully attain it. Um, is this Kanye at the peak of his white dick envy? How far will he go to get the respect he craves from the white affluent Eurocentric mainstream? I won't go through, uh, more, I want to move on to the next work, but um, I want to say, where's my favorite? Oh, I can't even find my own characters. Obama. So Obama, the great black hope, first black president. There's some critical stuff in here. For those of you who are looking for some critical takes on Obama, again, how do we celebrate our figures and also hold them accountable? And that's what this game is. And I think, you know, it was really interesting when I made this work and when I submitted this work, because I was so stressed out of all the things, not about the presentation or the, or the technical aspects, I was stressed out about using the N word because I was like, oh my God, this is a word that I use in my community, in safe spaces, in all black spaces with black folks. It's not a word that makes me bristle. I'm very comfortable with it. I use it less than Tarantino in life and in the game, but I was thinking, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? Because white liberals are gonna see this work and they're gonna be uncomfortable on my behalf and might not want to play the game or evaluate the work because they don't wanna offend the hypothetical me even though the me is making the game. And this actually happened. This happened when this game was supposed to be presented and streamed, the streamer fell out at the last minute and we had to find another person to play the game when the game was being celebrated with an award nomination. 
So like, this is a real thing, right? Like I can't even, I have to think about the performance of my blackness in like every space and who it's okay for. Okay, so, but this was a strategy to me, right? Deciding to use that word, deciding to speak in language that was clear, I was talking to black people. You know, I use us, I use we in the game. Um, very much black centered, not just in terms of representation, but in terms of, I think, both culture and experience, right? It's trying to unify those things and keep them intact. All right. So moving on to my next work, which takes um, sort of different strategy, which is the open source Afro hair library. Now, the open source Afro hair library, um, I got some funding back in 2020, which when Aaron was saying we met, you know, years ago, I'm like, oh my God, really? I've been in my house this whole time. So that feels like it was last week, but I guess it's been two years. Oh God. Um, <laughs> in 2020, I received funding uh, to develop this resource, a queer feminist in the grant writing. I said anti-racist, but more and more, I'm like, no, I need to say pro-black and anti-capitalist database for 3D models of black hair textures and styles. And uh, the reason why I was even thinking about making this work, right? Why make a, a, a database for 3D models of black hair? What's that about? I was actually working on um, a virtual reality piece, not a game exactly. It was using a game engine, but it was more like a documentary hybrid thing, media art, right? Um, and I it was called In Passing, and it was about how you navigate uh, public space, how we each navigate public space based on our self identifications and our perceived identities. And, you know, often there's a rift between those two. And so I was really pulling a very diverse group of people to, to um, make visible those differences and make visible, like some people have banal stories and some people have really harrowing stories. And I wanted to talk about that and unpack that. Um, so here's the thing, I'm not a 3D artist. Um, I'm always hacking things together. You know, I'm using software cre character creators. I'm just trying to figure out how to get the thing done. And um, I felt like I was doing pretty, pretty good. Like, honestly, I was using Mixamo and you'll see that here. You know, I'm using this thing. You can see they have different hair options. They have different body options. And then you can have all these parameters. So you can make them taller, you know, um, stretch their face, do all this stuff. And I'm like, I have about 20 characters and I need them to all look distinct, not look like these copy paste mannequins. And everything was going well until it came down to uh, the, a few black characters I had. I think it was like three or four black characters and the hair. The hair, right? After skin, hair to me is like one of the main identifiers of blackness. And I mean, and it matters because if I'm telling stories about this, right, how we're perceived, it's important that I'm able to capture, you know, if not an exact likeness, then something that resembles the um, features that allow others to identify us as Black people or as women or, you know, right, so this is one of the, one of the Black hairstyles, um, and I call it the Dolezal because it's sort of curly, but it's got these weird straight bits. It's in the way that, that Rachel Dolezal's faux blackness is in this uncanny valley version, this uncanny valley approximation of blackness. I think that this curly, coily, straight hair is also in some kind of uncanny valley of black hair. Here's this other black style. This is the only style that seemed like it had type four actually kinky, coily hair. And it's locks, but I would, I usually say locks, but in this case, I wanna say dreads, cause you know what? There are no parts to them and they are unstyled and there's a weird band at the front that makes no sense and then they just kind of do this. Um, and I know locks, you know, require maintenance. Think non-black people think that they just grow out of the head, but no, there's an entire category of stylists called a loctician. Like there's time and energy that goes into creating, forming and maintaining locks. So why would you spend that time and money to just have them doing all that? So problem. <laughs> I just caught the chat. So this is what I'm working with, right? And I worked with it. I did what I could. These are the two black characters that are that are in the game. Uh, for fun, I was in. I was literally making this project in Spokane, Washington, which is where Rachel Dolezal is. If you're like, who the heck is Rachel Dolezal? She's the white woman a few years ago that was outed as people didn't know she was white. I mean, I knew as soon as I saw her face, but it's Spokane. There's not a lot of Black people. I went there. I know. Uh, 
she was an NAACP chapter leader who everyone thought was black, who she said she had a black daddy. That was her play daddy. Another thing she appropriated for black culture. Um, and she wore her hair like this. This is not what she looked like at birth or like in her twenties, but she looked like this and it was very funny. <laughs> um, so I made her while I was in Spokane, but not very helpful to me trying to make black characters. So this is what started the open source Afro hair library. It was this problem. And I'm going to take a little detour and I'm going to talk about uh, populist algorithms because I do want to draw on, I want to highlight the work of uh, Dr. Sophia Noble, um, who talks about the way Google searches, for example, harm marginalized communities, right? And she's calling attention to something that seems banal um, can actually be oppressive. So in 2009, she was doing searches for Black girls, Latina girls, and Asian girls, and they returned pornographic images compared to the innocuous results that you would expect from searching white girls, which are innocent pictures of children. One of the things that she talks about in the book is that in this structure, um, when search algorithms are designed specifically to serve a user the most relevant information as possible, and relevance is determined by popularity, in this case for Google, when you click on a search and that says, oh, that's the one that people are looking for, that one's popular, then what happens is that this allows the majority of users to actually define cultural meaning and relevance. In this case, it was for Black girl, but I found something similar happening with Black hair. So when I found this issue, right, the little software I was using didn't have enough black hair options. What do I do? I'm going to go on the internet. I'm going to find some black hair options. I'm going to go to 3D marketplaces. And primarily, I went on a CG Trader and Turbo Squid. And here's the issue. Before, like right out of the gate, here's the problem. I go to a website and I search for black hair because that's what I call the hair on my head is black hair. That's it. This is what comes up. The first black person I see is bald. There's also a bear. This lady has a style. That's cool. That's looking good. You see, there's a lot of animals. About a third of the results are animals. A cow, a cat. Uh, this is female dreadlock. Um, I promise you, I clicked that. Those dreadlocks look terrible. And then a, a bald child. Okay, cool. Not helping. Here's some more. What else is happening here, right? Like black is being coded only as a color, not as an ethnic or cultural des descriptor. And by the way, these research results are, are new. This happened in the last few months. So this is like an update. Um, I'm gonna show you some of the original things that I found. I'm gonna read this quote from Du Bois. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Now, I was familiar with Du Bois's double consciousness and that, that goes back to that, that what I talked about before, right? I'm moving through the world with my experience, but I'm always aware, right, of this kind of surveillance, you know, in this case of, of a white gaze. I don't just see myself, I see myself being seen through the eyes of others, always. And I think when I look at these search results, I have a similar experience. So when I talk about the query issue, it's that if blackness doesn't mean black in this space, then I had to do this thing where I solved the puzzle. I had to imagine, right, the presumed non-black developer of a site like this and think, okay, what do they think of blackness? And I tried a bunch of things. I tried things that were inaccurate, right? I tried African-American, but black hair isn't bound by geography, right? So that doesn't make sense. I tried African again, right? I'm not looking for nations. I'm looking for a hair texture. I tried curly. I tried kinky. I tried nappy. And I was like, wait, am I okay with this presumed white developer even saying nappy, right? I have all this, this dialogue in my head. And then finally I felt so brilliant. I was like, I got the term. It's Afro. It's Afro because Afro is describes blackness and it's a hairstyle. I got it. I felt so good, y'all. You don't even know. And then here's what I got. <laughs> here's what we got. And, and these are the improved results, okay? This is the improved results after Turbo Squid emailed me and was like, wait, uh, we saw your essay. And this was done in like 2019 when I first talked about this. So 
Okay. Again, we still got bald folks, bald folks. Oh goodness. We have one looking pretty good, but then let's look what, what, what else we got. We have a hypersexualized, maybe teenage seeming body. And so I have to deal with that when I'm like, I'm not looking for this. I just want some hair. Why did I need all this? Right. And I'm not a prude, but I'm thinking again, I'm thinking about my little sister. I'm thinking about little black kids. I'm thinking back to that search for black girls, right. In the pornographic imagery and the hypersexualization. This isn't neutral, right? Check this out. Afro hair messy, C4D. This is in the, the I'm going to say this like the chocolate dipped Ken. These features don't feel like they're specifically black. This hair looks more like someone who stuck their finger in an electrical socket. This is more Einsteinian than black, but okay. There's this lady. Hey, here we go. <laughs> yeah. And then this person, black male Afro head Joe, this hurts me. And so you might be thinking like, oh, okay, well, this is just, this, these people just don't know how to sculpt. That's not, you know, that's not anti-blackness. That's just, you know, a uh, lack of technical prowess. But then we have things like this, where you see the sculpt. Actually, I'm like, this is a beautiful character model, but why is her, she's got like a packed in fro and a weird ponytail added? I don't even know how you get that style because when you smooth your hair and a ponytail doesn't look like that I have questions I have questions I don't think a black person designed this and then we have a super high quality sculpt right like this person knows how to sculpt and yet what do we have Bubba playing on stereotypes of incarceration we got the gold tooth we got the earring we have the scowl and this hair is still jacked up still so this is what happens when you go and search on these on these websites. And by the way, these are these are also recent. This one in particular is new. What is going on here? Why is this afro like a weird hat? We got the mustache. Look at these cornrows. You see the scalp all up. It's a problem. And so among these search results, we also have this woman, right? Beautiful hair that feels like, okay, I can work with that. That's looking good. Take a closer look. Isn't she gorgeous? Black female head, two styles, OG hair model. She's also $600. So this created another issue for me. I started to think, oh, wait a minute. Even when we find, even when we have representation, there's back to that word, even when we're included, because that's what they're doing. They're including us on these platforms. I'm going to skip this bit. What they're doing is they're including us in a marketplace, right? Like I started to think about this as I'm, as I'm going back and I'm looking through the search results, right? I'm like, oh, wait a minute, what are we doing? You see these naked black bodies just standing there in their t pose? Oh, I know what this reminds me of, the buying and selling of black bodies on a marketplace. That doesn't seem good. So suddenly I'm no longer concerned with this idea of inclusion, right? I'm thinking about, the logic of the platform itself. And this is why, because now there's press around this project and people ask, well, why wouldn't you just upload models to a database? Da, da, da. Well, this is why, because I don't actually want to include black people on this marketplace. And even when you see, you know, good representation, it's sitting adjacent to horrific representation. And we haven't even seen that yet. So if you think this was bad, wait for it. So I'm gonna go into this quote by Lord, Audre Lorde. For the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And I've been trying to hold this in my mind as I continue making work. So thinking about the open source Afro hair library, these are some of the questions I've had. What does decolonizing design look like? Where's the distinction between caretaking and gatekeeping? And how can I build a resource of refusal? How do I construct a resource if I don't want to give you what you're looking for? And what do I mean by that? Well, brace yourselves. Here are some of the imagers, and some of them are still up, and you can find them online, uh, but some of their names, have been, they've been renamed to, and to be obscured. But these are some of the original images I found in my research, which was in 2019, only three years ago. Feels like 10 years ago. This is supposed to be a Black woman. This is the three-pack rig animated black family. This is a black woman and she was interesting because um, 
this was one of the first models that I found that actually had at the time, like authentic black hair, because it's, you know, it's a 3D scan of an actual black person. And so she's got these beautiful individual box braids and I love this, but she is completely naked, spread eagle. And if you look closely, that is rope around her neck and wrists. So again, making me think of the commodified blackness, blackness as, as you know, uh, a product, something to be owned. And then we always have something like this. There's a theme here. It's like the tribal, you know, if I search for African, right? If I search for Afro, if I search for anything that I get these, like you get a lot of generic voodoo warriors and tribal things that, that you know, are pretty regressive and outright insulting. So why don't I wanna give you what you're looking for? I'm building a database, I'm building a resource where you can get 3D models. Well, I don't wanna give you what you're looking for because what you're looking for is racist. That's why. Okay. So this is the main body of my talk. And this is where I wanna get into some other stuff and I wanna unpack some of this stuff, okay? Um, we have a little bit of time. I'm going to show you a bunch of uh, a bunch of progress that we've made on the open source Afro Hair Library. So I feel like as I'm designing this site, and there's a lot of web design and there's a lot of color scheme design. What you're seeing even in my presentation, these are colors from the Afro uh, Hair Library. I've been trying to challenge myself from falling into any kind of default from the color scheme, even. You know, I was thinking about what I associate as traditional sort of Afrocentric colors, right? Themes from um, different African nations. And I, I've been really, I don't know if this is problematic. I don't know what this is, right? I and mean, it's something I'm moving through. And one of the reasons why OSAL has developed as a community, it's because I, I've thought about my position as a Black American and the way that my grandparents, for example, felt like there was a kind of fetishization of continental Africa that it was because we don't have a home in the US and because we're denigrated here that we have to go back. And that's the only place in which, you know, we can find a kind of um, pride. Um, and I feel like I do find pride in my heritage and ancestry, but I think I can't let that be a shield for American imperialism, right? And so I've thought really carefully about, okay, how do I construct um, even a visual aesthetic, right? How do I contribute to the black visual canon without just sort of extracting something else, right? Without denying my own positionality. So I've been um, drawing inspiration from uh, films like Moonlight and the color palettes in uh, Insecure and thinking about, you know, let's bring some purple, let's think about the, especially working in 3D, right? And thinking about how lighting becomes important in that space. Drawing my color palette for the site from the ways in which I want to light black skin. And so you see these, uh, these purples, these oranges, these really beautiful colors. And also really intentionally designing a resource that is for all forms of blackness. I think something that also happens when it comes to black representation or, or even um, black initiatives is that we can very easily fall into the same logics of dominance, right? There's a reason why I say this, this resource is anti-capitalist. When I say anti-capitalist, I'm thinking about racial capitalism. I'm thinking about getting outside of the marketplace. So when I'm designing this uh, resource, even though we're producing these, these models, which I'll show you, I'm actually thinking about the models as artifacts. I'm thinking about the products as secondary and that the real work here is building the black community out in the 3D space. It's paying black artists. It's giving them the material resources and the communal support to author our own depictions and developing the site as a source of um, communal resource protection and knowledge production and reproduction. And so the site is actually designed to go back to the search algorithm. There's no search algorithm in the open source software hair library. Instead, um, we, we, I wanted to design something that doesn't allow you as a user to go to a resource, find exact, type in what you want, find it and extract it and then leave. I'm designing the entire site actually as a rabbit hole where the first thing that you see is you're confronted with these incredible um, awe-inspiring visions of Blackness that regardless of where you're at, whether you're a Black person, a non-Black person, whether your idea of Blackness is minstrels and mammies, or it's something, you know, uh, more Black Panther-esque, that whoever you are, that your imaginary for what Blackness can be in virtual space is challenged and expanded. And so immediately you see uh, the models, and the only way to really navigate is you have to navigate by searching through the artists and their series, 
and through a series of tags. And the reason why I'm using tags instead of a search bar is because just to engage and interact with the website, because I don't want you to have an extractive relationship with it. You are forced to either know and through the process of using the site, learn the vernacular of black hair. So this is all of the things I'm sort of thinking about when I think about how do I get away from just representation, knowing this will be open, and how do I right, keep it whole? How do I keep the culture and how do I keep the experience and the stories and the identities of Blackness all together in this space? So uh, now to the super exciting part and my last three minutes before questions is I put in a whole bunch of models into this slot, into this um, presentation. Many are never seen before. So you'll be getting the first look and I hope that they uh, do what they're meant to do. Uh, so another feature of the open source Afro hair library is that, um, you know, I've been thinking about, I've really been inspired actually by the fashion industry in some ways, and particularly the way that they treat designers. In fashion, the designer's name is as important, if not more important than what they're producing, than the actual garments. Um, but then in games and 3D media, particularly in games, right, the 3D artists are actually treated more like garment workers, where their labor is invisible. They're the ones making this, but you don't see their names. They're not really platform. They're not really highlighted. And so a big thing is to always, like all of the models are always shown with the artist. And so there are artist statements that are written. And so we're really making sure that, you know, this is not a neutral space. This is a space that has a voice and has multiple voices. And that's through these artists. And I should mention that these artists um, came together through the first um, OSAL Fellowship, which is an artist residency program for Black 3D artists. Um, we had six who completed the residency. And um, these are artists from across the globe, like actually representing the diaspora. And so I'm really, really excited about that. So this is a uh, evening cicada. This is the, their series, um, Afro Mythics, where they, in this one I'm going to show you, they reimagine the, uh, I always get this wrong, Akro Bumelu, the scorpion man. Um, and what they're doing is looking at uh, an Afrocentric reimagining of mythical creatures across the globe. And so this is one of their works. I'm going to leave these artist statements here and I'll post this, or this will be recorded so you can go through it and you can see it on the website. But I just want to show you some of the beautiful imagery. This is Javon Wilson. Uh, her series was ready-made and she's featuring these sculptural styles. This is a quote from this I love from her was, through the act of adornment, we make ourselves ready to face the challenges to come. So she's really looking at um, styling as like a kind of armor for black femmes. Aren't these just gorgeous? And you may have seen this one with the article that's going around. This is one of my favorite styles. It's really gorgeous. Kanisha Perry, also Timid Clover, um, does incredible, has an incredible series called Hey Queen, which highlights the versatility of locks. And we need it because in games in particular, locks are always the same locks. And so she wanted to create something that felt both regal and familiar. And I love this because one of my aspirations for the library is not that it just increases, you know, diverse styles and a variety of diversity. When I say diversity, I mean diversity within Blackness um, in the 3D realm. But I love the idea of like, you know, a little black femme like me coming to this site, not knowing anything about games, maybe just looking for a nice hairstyle, and then maybe recreating some of these in the real world, in the corporeal form. Here's another of, of hers. So pretty. We have Future Proof by H.G. Harris, and they were one of uh, my first collaborators that actually helped me develop the proof of concept styles that helped me get some grants, and I love working with them. Uh, future Proof examines uh, Harris technology, imagining a future where Black people are not only present, but continue to exist at the forefront of cultural innovation. Future Proof asserts that Black drip is never obsolete. Super Fuchsia describes Black women as the blueprint for cultural trends and her deepest source of inspiration. Her series Prototypical shows off a dazzling array of permed and pressed styles because above all else, Black hair is versatile. And so we're seeing straight styles, but still, again, right, not just looking at, at texture, but the, the technique that goes into this. So even something that's, that's been straightened is still black. Malika Matumbo intertwines the fantastical with the everyday, creating work that is eerily mesmerizing in her Transfiction series. And you'll re recognize this from the beginning of the talk. I love Malika's work. And that's the last image that I have. That's the open source software hair library, and that's yay or nay, and that's my talk, and 
that's all I got. Thank you so much. I see a hand raise. Am I supposed to be leading this now? <laughs> oh, no, no. Thank you so much, AM. Um, uh, I, I can uh, ask uh, folks if there's any questions once I figure out how to get my Zoom windows to work again. Um, but that was an amazing talk. So uh, thank you for, for giving it. And yeah, I, I think it'd be great if um, we could open the floor to any questions, perhaps starting with a student question. I think it, it might be nice um, if uh, we could uh, get some student energy in the room before we uh, move into a broader discussion first. Yeah, Imani. Yeah, um, I will first like to start by saying amazing job. Like this is like amazing. Like, oh my gosh, I love this. But um, it really aligns with oh, Jihan here on here too. So that's perfect. Um, it this talk was like right on time because this morning me myself, uh, me myself, myself, Jihan and Whitney, we were having a talk with Melissa about the representation of black women in um, gangs, specifically NBA 2K. So um, I think I actually want to pass it over to Jihan because I didn't know she was on the call to, uh, to talk more about that and get some feedback on that from your perspective. I just wanted to say as a black woman that's currently doing research on just black female characters, um, particularly in gaming and esports and HBCUs, thank you. Um, but then also what is some of the research that you've discovered while um, just developing these characters, especially in just like games, NBA 2K with the big issue or divide when it comes to black male characters and black female characters. So it's interesting because in a lot of ways, I just try to stay out of the game space. I know games because I, like I grew up on games, like you know, Super Mario is older than me. So I like really, <laughs> since I was a little tiny kid, like my earliest memories are, are uh, playing Atari, playing Nintendo, watching Roots and watching Reading Rainbow and also being driven around during the time of the LA uprising, right? In response to the, more, to the Rodney King verdict. So like all of these things exist in this mash in my head. And so when I think about black representation, the specifics I haven't really been doing that research on. I know that the, to me, where most Black representation is, like authentic Black hair representation, exists in NBA 2K. But why is that? Because it's attached to actual living celebrity male figures. And so part of the selling point of that game, again, so this is why it's like the capitalist logic. It's like you want to capture their likeness because people want to identify with the black male players. They want to experience their embodiment. And that's the motive. So that's why there's resources, you know, and energy and time. There's enough time to focus on getting the hair right. And I say right, you know, with air quotes, because I thought of like a few years ago, when I think about 2K, I'm just thinking about a few years ago, I'm thinking about it as a game that's in the background for me. And I'm like, oh yeah, I know that, that that's where the, you see a lot of character selection. I see my brothers play that game. But then when I do start reading just in the past like few months, right, about this representation, it's like, actually folks are saying that those hairstyles aren't always looking so good, aren't so authentic. And I don't know what, I think it was 2K. I was really surprised a few months ago when I saw some video on Twitter and it was like, I think they were showcasing an ad for like State Farm or something in the game. And I was like, why is the black character? I guess, cause it's an NPC. I was like, are all dark skin black characters just look like Gumby? Do they all just have this weird skin and what's going on the haircut? So it's funny to see that even in games that are clearly trying to profit off of and capitalize off of black cultures and black bodies, that the resources are still not putting in the kind of like resources and intentionality into all aspects. And I say I'm surprised, but also that just that tracks, right? So if you can't even get it right in those games that are meant to capture real player likenesses, then, you know, it makes sense what we're seeing everywhere else. Thank you for that. That was a wonderful question. Um, any other questions while we still have a little bit of time?
I've got one while the room marinates. Um, and I was curious if um, you could speculate or jam a little on uh, Afrofuturism and how you see that as being like an aesthetic movement that relates or doesn't relate to your work. I think it does relate, but I think for now I'm not, I mean, of course it makes sense I'm getting asked this question more and more often, but I feel like, so I talked about this early in one of my meetings, but my training is in design, right? Like visual design and then media arts. And one of the reasons why I do this kind of work is because I wasn't exposed. Like I was not studying critical race theory. I was not introduced to feminist frameworks like in my, neither my undergrad or my graduate training. And I had to come to it like through my experience. I had to come to it after the fact, even now, um, to try to reconcile my experience and my identity with the work I was doing in the spaces I was operating in. And I was actually, it's so funny, I'm now, I do teach in critical race and ethnic studies. And one of the reasons I joined that department at the time as a program, but yeah, we've departmentalized, was because I wanted to be in a space with scholars who had devoted their time and lives to this kind of work so I could understand and integrate it into my work. And so to get back to Afrofuturism, I was aware of Afrofuturism as an aesthetic, but it's only now that I'm diving into like the politics of Afrofuturism as being more, you know, not being just about this kind of speculation or a speculative black future, but really about the now, really about existing on a different plane, really about, you know, not, again, blackness being able to exist on its own terms. And so um, one of the things we're doing in this class that I'm teaching is diving into the black arts movement as well and understanding, you know, okay, what was going on uh, the black art with the black arts movement and the Harlem Renaissance and how were artists slash activists slash everything, right? Um, working to operate outside of these hegemonic uh, paradigms. And so for me, I'm still learning and understanding. And um, so we've announced a launch. I've announced a launch date. I didn't mean to. I talked to a reporter and I said it and it's been printed. Now everybody knows and I'm sweating bullets. I'm like, oh God, it's real. But um, I did announce the launch date for the library as Juneteenth of 2023. And if I was just focused on you know, the materials, I could launch the library much sooner. But I actually wanted to devote a year of just focusing my scholarly research on understanding the politics. Because when this is put out into the world as an open library, right? It's open source and open source purists would say no limitations, but open source purists, by the way, open source is less diverse than text. It's more whiter and duder. So I think about, well, what is it? I wanna understand what it means to, to protect blackness without having proprietary relationship to it, right? I don't wanna own blackness. I wanna make this open, but I also come from a, a, a people who are predictably, reliably, cons consistently, economically and culturally exploited. And so I need to understand um, how you steward something. This is where I talk about how do we caretake this because it won't exist if we can't protect it from exploitation. And so I'm spending literally a year just doing, as I'm launching the fellowship and doing other residencies and doing this other work on the design, I'm actually just doing a whole lot of reading and sitting and writing to not only theorize black virtuality, but also, you know, attendant to that is, is that protecting. How do I ensure this kind of resource for generations? That's my answer to that. <laughs> and I'm gonna let my cat out. I really think that was a beautiful sentiment, uh, and uh, I think we have time for one more question if anybody uh, wants to get one in there, uh, but it's got to be short because we're basically at time. So. Hey, come on. Yeah, Bo. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Anne. That was amazing. Um, I will try and ask this as a quick question. Um, I really love and respect your approach of uh, saying, I will not give you what you want, and I will not make this searchable, and I will not make this consumable in the ways that you want. And I wonder what that means for you working within an institution. When you are challenging um, inclusion and you're challenging empathy, how do you make that possible while working for an institution. I'm just thinking about our students who will go on into similar positions. Um, the short answer is I am always angry. I wake up and I'm happy and I have a cat and my cat's there. And then I'm as soon as I open my phone and read an email or see a posting or see my work posted or, or go on Twitter, I'm just mad again. And so it's a daily cycle of that. Um, 
but it's interesting. So I'm teaching a course um, for grad students right now that's called Praxis and Identity. And it's about developing and identifying your personal practices. What is the, the emotional, spiritual, and political why of your making, which I think you need to know in order to, you know, why do you do this work? And so that you can marry, you know, your theory, your leftist tendencies and all of that to what you're actually doing. Um, and then identity. And identity is interesting because, you know, as I have more of a public identity, I was, I've been talking about this idea of, you know, uh, in the past 10 or 15 years, this idea of speaking your truth has taken hold. And in some ways I appreciate that because it's, you know, validating lived experience, right? It's validating what you experience and that is, is, is real knowledge. But I also realize I'm making this, I'm like, I don't wanna speak my truth, I'm tired of that. I wanna speak my fiction, right? I wanna author that. And so I think, you know, as I've been talking to grads and, uh, you know, who are artists, you know, going into these spaces, I've been talking about how, right, like you don't owe anyone all of your truth and you can author that and you can be strategic and you can be, you know, you can deploy different versions of yourself as needed and also protect the things that are most precious. And so I think that's something I'm thinking about for my own life, you know, as a scholar and at, be, working in university, as I think about this, this, um, archive database resource community, right? Cause I build the things that I need and I need protection. I need protection for my own institution, right? I need protection when the only time I get an email is it's February, hi, I don't know anything about your work. Haven't even looked at the website on my own UCSC server. Don't know who you are, but it's February, you're black, let's talk. And I have to shut down articles about this project because they're positioned talking about black people and their hair. And I'm like, when you say their hair, you realize that you're othering black folks and letting every black person know that we don't really exist in this institution. We're on the fringes, we're outside. So, you know, I mean, I guess I do it by um, being angry and also speaking my anger and being loud and being communicative um, and trying as best as I can not to take any shit, even though I'm only assistant professor, you know, I'm still in precarity, but I feel like there's a way that you can, you can and must set a standard and expectation for yourself. And just because I know we're over time, but I want to read this one thing, because this comes up not just in the university, but as I become more public and my work is spread, you know, there's this game of telephone where my goals are diluted. And so this was a tweet that pissed me off recently. And it was um, from Black Enterprise. They did a story based on a Vice article that went viral. Um, they didn't speak to me as a source. They just did a story, right? And so they, this is the, the headline. The open source Afro hair library strives to normalize black hair inclusion in gaming. None of those things are true. No, no. My response is this is incorrect. I'm not normalizing anything. Black hair is my hair. It's in every game I make. From my position, it's already normal. And I have to assert that Afro hair library is a political project that centers blackness for a presumed black audience. And I'm gonna have to do that everywhere in every fashion. So, you know, it's just something you have to take into account with your work, because especially when you make work that is going to be open and is going to be shared. I think, you know, I have a I have a lab right now that's called the Other Lab, but I actually just recently got funding to plan um, the establishment of the Center for Black Virtuality. And something I realized is that I have to say black, even as much as I want to build, you know, a coalition of solidarity. If I don't say black then everyone else will benefit from that space. And I never see my own face reflected back at me when it comes to my community and my students and those who I'm trying to be in dialogue with. And, you know, it's not because there's anything wrong with other folks being in, in the space, but you have to make space for Blackness specifically. And I think the larger message is that you have to know what your political goals are because they're going to be wrested away from you if you don't hold that strongly and consistently and repeatedly. That was amazing. Thank you, Am. Let's all give Am one last round of applause and uh, just so much gratitude for you coming here, speaking and sharing all of your amazing work with us. So, so thank you. Um, yeah. So um, I think that's it for the the seminar. I'll flip back over to Daniel just for some last words. But uh, thank you all for coming. I I don't have anything. Thank you so much, Am. Take care, everyone. <laughs>